Dr. David Relman with Stanford Medicine joins us now to talk about the latest COVID-19 developments. Thanks for joining us. Now, we've been hearing a lot about a promising vaccine candidate from Oxford. What are the findings of that trial so far? So the Oxford trial is one of many trials that are ongoing. It, um, in this particular case, it uses a vaccine that was created using a, a common respiratory cold virus called adenovirus. It uses a version of that virus that is naturally found in monkeys and chimpanzees, which is um, generally um, a wise strategy because if you were to use the human version of these cold viruses, which others are doing, you would find that many of us already have some antibodies against that cold virus and will not respond terribly well to this new vaccine. So that's what they did. They took a, this adenovirus, it's called. They put in the genetic material that encodes for the SARS coronavirus um, spike protein. They injected it into a number of volunteers, and then they looked to see what kind of immune responses were elicited. And what they found was that there were some pretty substantial antibody responses to the vaccine, and there were some responses, they say, that were of this um, second type um, with the immune system. The immune system is capable of two kinds of responses, antibody and cellular, and both are important. In fact, it will probably turn out that the cellular response to SARS coronavirus is as important, if not more important, than the antibody response, even though we've all been focusing on antibodies. So what Oxford did is to look at both, and they found that both did respond, both did um, generate responses to their vaccine, and they, they followed their, their volunteers for just a number of weeks, not terribly long, and, and even tried two doses in some of them. So it's a, it's a, a reasonably successful um, early effort to see whether their vaccine elicits the kind of responses that you would hope to see in something that will turn out to be protective. This vaccine that Oxford just, uh, just presented is one of several that are now in what are called phase two and early phase three um, trials. The others that have received news recently are those that use a different approach. They are so-called RNA vaccines. These are vaccines that actually inject the genetic material of the virus and allow parts of the virus to be made in the human body, not the whole thing, just parts, and thereby stimulate an immune response. These other vaccine trials, Moderna is one that's received a lot of attention. Another is Pfizer. Both of them using RNA approaches also have very promising early results where there is both the antibody response and the cellular response. They are responses that you would hope to see in someone who is going to be protected. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm now about the fact that we have several possible vaccines, all with promising but early uh, responses and data. And the issue now is simply going to be developing the numbers and then eventually looking to see whether people are actually protected against the real virus in the real world. So Stanford Healthcare launched a clinical trial to see if an antiviral medication could reduce symptoms. Can you tell us more about that trial? Sure. Uh, there is a trial that is uh, ongoing. In, in fact, I think recruitment has now finished but the data are not yet available. In fact, the samples are all still blinded. Nobody really knows what the trial has shown, but the approach was to say, this virus has a couple of important strategies. The first is it needs to replicate early in the course of infection. To do so, it subverts and dampens your own body's natural protective response against viruses. One of those protective responses is called the interferon response. Interferons are proteins made by our body that counteract uh, viruses and other infectious agents and do so in a pretty effective manner. Turns out that most successful pathogens or disease-causing microbes are pretty good at, um, at 
outfoxing our own immune system. And in this case, what they do, and this SARS coronavirus is an example, it actually turns off that response that we would normally rely upon. And it does that early while it needs time to start replicating. Once its numbers have built up, it actually then exploits the fact that our now belated immune response is going into overdrive. It's, it's a bit too much and it's too late from the human immune response point of view, but for the virus, it's now simply causing more damage and um, perhaps allowing it to spread. Um, so what this trial was all about was to say, what if we give people some additional interferon early in the infection to see whether it might um, thwart this scheme, this diabolical scheme that the virus is using? We don't know the answer. In theory, this should be one of a number of similar kinds of thoughtful um, counter strategies against this virus, where we say, let's look at what it's trying to do. Let's try to thwart or subvert it and try to make up for the, the deficit that it causes in us. So that's, it's, it's a basic approach. It's um, almost the yin to the yang, which is the other basic approach to this virus, treating the virus, which is to say, let's actually impair the replication of the virus itself. Let's knock down the virus directly with a drug that counteracts its ability to grow. And that's the other, so far, um, promising strategy that seems to work. Both of them are probably gonna rely very heavily on when it is that we decide to give these drugs. If you give them early, I think the chances, and many people think the chances will be much more favorable for success. You need to get ahead of this virus. You can't let it establish itself and then try to essentially play catch up. This approach using interferon could actually be harmful if it's given too late. And so the key here is gonna be not just discovering what can work, but discovering exactly when it is that it needs to be given to work. Now, we heard from the CDC recently that the number of COVID-19 cases could be up to 13 times higher than reported in parts of the U.S. What do those findings tell us? These recent findings support earlier findings that were um, generated by a number of groups, some of them here in the Bay Area. They all have been um, based upon the idea that we are simply not testing enough. We're not testing enough people. We're not testing often enough. And therefore, isn't it possible that we have missed a lot of infections? And that part of it is because the, the infections that we're missing don't cause much in the way of symptoms. We wouldn't otherwise know without testing. So this study that the CDC just undertook was a study to look, use um, tests looking for antibodies, which again, are simply measures of past infection. And this study, like some others, shows that there are many more people who have antibody, meaning have evidence of a past infection, than we thought we knew about from the, the direct viral testing that we've done so far. So this means that um, many of those who wondered, maybe there's a much larger denominator, a much larger um, population of people who have seen this virus, been infected uh, and recovered, um, is in fact true. And the estimate from this study, actually for the Bay Area, is that the underestimate is ninefold. In other words, there actually have been, as of the end of April, nine times more infections in the Bay Area than we knew about from the viral testing that we had already done. Is this, is this good or bad news? It, it, it's actually a little bit of both. The good news is that it means that as suspected, there really are a number of people who can be infected and not get very sick. So that's good. The bad news is that we're missing a lot of infection. And there are still many, many more people who are still susceptible than there are people who have been infected and are perhaps less vulnerable. 
So it means, again, we're playing catch up here. We need to start, you know, um, skating to where the puck will be, not to where it was some number of weeks ago. And I think this will be a further case for saying, let's get out there and strengthen our surveillance with antibody tests, with viral uh, strategies, testing strategies. But also in the meantime, let's do even more than we have to try to um, shut down this, this uh, virus and its transmission. Because while we're waiting to try to find out where it is, it's already moving like, like wildfire. And, and we can't allow that to happen. And I know the research keeps on changing. Do we have a better idea of just how deadly it is? The, the rates at which this virus causes death are something that has been incredibly controversial and more so uncertain. And part of the uncertainty has been that we have never had a good idea of what is the true denominator. What is the true number of people who have been infected? Not just the number of people who have had symptoms, which we also don't know, but at least have a better idea about, but what is the true number of people who have been infected at all? When we know that number, then we can look and say, okay, we do know how many people have died. What is that fraction? What is that percentage? The current data say that that percentage, the so-called infection fatality rate, varies incredibly from one person to another. Why? First of all, because age is an incredibly important determinant of the outcome. If you are 23, 17, the likelihood, if infected, that you will die from this infection is well below 1%. In fact, it could be even below 0.1%, meaning that your chance is one in a thousand, one in 2000, something like that. Um, maybe even lower if you're a teenager. Does that mean that this is a benign virus? Absolutely not. Why? Because when you talk about people who are now in their 50s or 60s, that case fatality rate goes rocketing upward, and we're now talking 2%, 3%, 5%. If you're a 70-year-old, maybe 8%. If you're well in your 80s, or even if not, if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you, if you are overweight, if you have any of a number of other factors, some of which we don't understand, you could be in that 3%, 5%, 8% fatality rate population. And that is a very serious problem. The, the fact is this, right now, 144,000 Americans have died. That's simply a fact. That is a huge number. That is way beyond the worst annual flu season that we ever see. That number is more like, let's say, 70 or 80,000 for the entire country for an entire year. This is 144,000 for just a handful of months. That number is also going up quite quickly. I would guess that by the fall, we could be close to 200,000 if we're not doing something much more aggressively and much more seriously than we are right now. So again, the answer to the question is, it depends. It depends who you are. It depends on factors that we both understand and don't understand. It is certainly not a virus that we can simply shirk off. And one last point about this. If you are in a group that we think is very low risk for death, you are in a very high risk group for transmitting. And when you transmit, you do a number of things. You put other people at immediate direct risk you also make it increasingly impossible for our community to go back to normal activity. When you transmit, even as an asymptomatic person, you're making it almost impossible for us to open schools, open workplaces, um, get back to the things that you want to be able to do. So everybody, it's, it's on everybody to do the right thing, even for their own interests. Um, and we certainly hope that everyone's interested in the interests of others as well. 
Well, the state of California's reopening plan already faced several setbacks because of the rise in COVID-19 cases. How much faster could we get things under control if everybody did wear masks and stay socially distanced? We still think that the, the most direct important ways of controlling transmission are the somewhat simple but very difficult to, to follow measures which include face coverings, hand washing, and social distancing, as well as diminishing the density of people in a closed space. It, it's, it's actually fairly simple. This virus is very transmissible. It's dependent upon how much virus you're exposed to over what period of time. And that in turn is simply a function of how much virus is there in the airspace you're breathing? Is there any circulation to disperse the virus? And how long are you there? And that's where the face coverings matter. That's where the, the hand washing also matters because touching your face clearly transmits. Um, and that's where the distancing and where it is you are, indoors, outdoors matters. And I think the unfortunate and sad fact is this is harder for any of us than we had thought. It's easier for a short period of time to sustain than it is for a long period of time. And this virus is so transmissible that simply doing all these things diligently for a short time is not enough. The more disease we have in our community, the longer we're gonna have to really bear down on these tough measures. And I'm afraid that right now we have taken our foot off of the brakes enough to allow enough virus to start transmitting that it's now going to be um, an issue of returning to a much more diligent, much more controlled, much more restrictive um, set of measures for some period of time in order to get our, our, you know, our collective hands around this virus and contain it again. We did it effectively this spring. But now we've allowed more virus to transmit and to do it again is going to take an even, I'm afraid, even tougher effort than we did uh, in the spring. But it's going to be absolutely necessary. There is just no way we are going to return to anything close to normal activity until we do it. And I'd say the sooner we do it, the better. I'm Dr. David Relman with Stanford Medicine. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. You're welcome.